morning, FAC. Welcome. Uh, if you're a guest with us uh, today, I do extend a warm welcome to you. My name is Mike Kazarowski. I'm the uh, lead pastor here at FAC, and uh, we love new people. We, we love people that have been coming for decades. And uh, it's my desire that if you've come here for 40 plus years, or this is your first time here, uh, that I would know you uh, and uh, that you would know me. And so I'd invite you to um, feel free to introduce yourself after service uh, to me up front here. Uh, I, like I said, I'd love the chance just to meet you and uh, get to know you a little bit. I, I'd also invite you to stop by our connection point, which is located out the back of these, uh, of these two doors. Uh, we always have somebody there, at least one or two people there to, to greet you and answer any questions that you uh, might have. Um, as we enter into a time of worship through music, uh, through singing, through the preaching of God's word, through the sharing of the gospel, I want to open us up to Psalm 40 and read just uh, the first five verses uh, to set our hearts uh, before God. This is a Psalm of David. He writes, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. Would you pray with me as we begin our time together? Heavenly Father, we praise your name and we sing of your wondrous deeds, Lord. Um, uh, if we could take all the time to just declare your glory and to declare your majesty, we would run out of time, Father, uh, because your glory and your majesty is so great and so large and so expansive, Father, that we can't even comprehend it, Lord. And so we offer something to you today. It's uh, very little. It's not much, Lord, but we would ask that you would take what we have to offer and, and that it would be pleasing to you, Lord, and it would glorify your name. And in your holy name I pray. Amen. Would you stand as we worship through music?
till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death, and the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who The church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who is resurrected me. You are here, moving in the midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Say it again. You are here. You are here.
it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never sing it out loud. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, Lord, for you. with me there's nothing there's nothing worth more that could ever come close nothing can compare your living hope your presence Lord and I tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes clean and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit and Holy Your 
Father God, we lift up a heart of praise to you this morning. And Lord, we thank you that we enter into the holy of holies, Jesus, through your sacrifice that you made on on the cross for us. And the love that you have for us. It's as strong as a first love. And Lord, would we not forget our first love found in you? Would we push away the things of this world to, to follow hard after you, Lord, so we can finish the race well? to glorify you. Jesus, we thank you for this time that we've had together and we look forward to see what you're going to do in our hearts and in our lives. Jesus, in your holy and awesome name we pray. And all God's children said, amen. You may be seated. Amen. This morning we're going to be in Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 10. Uh, So if As you're getting situated and grabbing your seat, go ahead and grab your Bibles and meet me there. Uh, Once again, that's Acts 16, 6 through 10. Uh, We'll read that together. Today does mark the first week of Advent, um, the first Sunday of Advent. So starting next Sunday, we'll actually begin a short series uh, in the first chapter of John to prepare us as a church for Christmas. Uh, And then we'll take an appropriate break from Acts until... Uh, the new year. And so this will be our last Sunday in the book until we resume in 2021. Um, So let's go ahead and turn together uh, to God's word. It's Acts 16, verses 6 through 10. Go ahead and follow along as I read. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, But the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Would you pray with me? Father, as we engage with your living word, I pray that we would tread carefully, yet cling confidently to your good and perfect word. I thank you uh, that you have provided this text to us so that we may have full hope in your work in our lives. Would your spirit now illuminate us and would our ways be your ways? In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, Lately, my wife and I have been enjoying the show The Amazing Race. Uh, This show has been, I said they had like 32 seasons, and we're watching the latest uh, season. And if you're unfamiliar with it, uh, it's a reality show where 11 teams of two, you've got pairs of two, 11 of them, they literally race around the world. 
uh, and the winner gets like this grand prize of some ridiculous amount of money. Um, each episode is a leg of the race, and whoever finishes last in each leg most of the time is eliminated from the race. So you really you you get down to like three teams, and then whoever wins the last leg wins the whole thing. Um, during each leg, to make it more interesting, because who wants to just watch a bunch of people fly planes around the world, uh, the teams come up to what are called detours. And uh, in the detours, they have to complete certain challenges in different countries before they're given their next destination. And these challenges are designed to disrupt and frustrate their race. Some of these detours are just absolutely grueling to the point where a team who is well ahead in the race can soon fall behind in the pack. They come up to a detour that they just can't figure out. It's a challenge that they just spend hours on because they can't quite seem to figure it out. And their irritation and their disappointment only grows as they witness other teams fly by them in the race. As a metaphor, uh, we know this feeling all too well in our race of life. Uh, That frustrating, irritating feeling where you've planned your life the way that you want. You are headed a certain direction for a particular destination and then God gives the detour. God throws the curveball, and it just frustrates our plans. It knocks us off the horse. I am convinced that there is not a single soul in the room that has not experienced this to some degree, that that frustrating feeling that just things aren't going according to my plan, and I don't like it, and I don't like the cavalier way in which God is handling my life right now. If everyone has felt that, that means that every one of us can resonate with the Apostle Paul and his traveling companions here in Acts 16 because they come face to face with this exact experience. They come face to face with literal detours in their travels. Now let's take a look at the passage together. and Keep in mind that this passage is in the context of the Great Commission. Right at the the very beginning of Acts, Jesus sat down with his disciples and he said, I want you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and then to the end of the earth. Jesus told his followers that they needed to take this message, his message of the gospel, to this local area, Jerusalem, being Jerusalem, out to a regional area, being Judea and Samaria, and then out globally. And The flow of the book of Acts has actually followed that structure as we've seen uh, throughout the whole year. The gospel is well on its way out to the end of the earth. And Paul and his missionary team take this charge very seriously. They take this commissioning seriously, which is why they're traveling to to begin with. If you've just joined us or you've parachuted into the book of Acts and you've landed here in Acts 16, uh, you'll notice that Paul and his team are traveling. But we have to understand that Paul's travels here are not some sort of vacation. The purpose of Paul's travels is not sightseeing. It's not that he wants to go out and see the world. No, their travels are purposeful. They're meaningful. They're intentional. They're strategic. Paul has a roadmap, if you will, of how he intends to see the gospel out to the end of the earth. He he says, Jesus has given me a task, and I'm going to take that seriously, and so I have this detailed plan on how to execute this mission successfully. I I have the the plan that we're going to go do. And then all of a sudden, Paul and his team come face to face with some significant detours. Right In the passage, we actually last left them in the cities of Lystra and Derby. Um, that's where they picked up Timothy. We looked at that last week. Paul met Timothy. He intentionally chose Timothy to follow him. Timothy was willing to follow Paul. That all happened in, in this southern region of Galatia. It's uh, where Lystra and Derby and Iconium are there too. 
Um, I've got a map that I want to show you that will help us understand the geography of the passage that we just read. Right? So, so in the beginning of Acts 16, they're in Lystra, they're in Derby, and then according to the text, the intent was for them to go to Asia. Now, don't think of Asia how uh, we may understand Asia as a continent. Remember that this was 2,000 years ago, th these events, and their understanding of geography and even their labels of geography were much different than ours. Uh, Asia is not where we th would think it is. Asia then was actually a territory in the western part of modern-day Turkey. That's where they wanted to go. That was their, their intention to go to Asia. And they're most likely uh, trying to get to Ephesus, which is the capital city of Asia. It's a very important city. And uh, so it would make sense, right, to strategically go to the, the place of significance in Asia. But we read in verse 6 that they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And so you look at that and you say, well, now wait a minute. I thought Jesus commissioned them to go out in the power of the Spirit into the, to, to the whole world to speak the gospel. And now all of a sudden the Holy Spirit is forbidding them to preach the gospel? But that, that seems actually contradictory to what Jesus said in Acts 1, isn't it? Well, to, to help us understand um, this, there's actually a word, that word forbidden can mean something else. Uh, the word forbidden in this context can also mean hinder, to hinder. The Holy Spirit hindered them from going to Asia. They were prevented from it. They were denied access somehow. And so it's a closed door, right, in their travels. And since they couldn't go to Ephesus, they tried to uh, head north of Ephesus to Mysia, where they made plans and provisions to go even further north to this region of Bithynia, which is at the very top of that map. But once again... The Holy Spirit prevents them from going to Bithynia. They hit another roadblock. At this point, you can really feel for Paul and his companions, right? You've got to be thinking like, what, what gives God? We're trying to do this great work for you, and everywhere we turn, you've set up a detour. You've thrown a roadblock in the way. God, what are you doing? What's the purpose of this? And so they're all probably just sitting there scratching their heads thinking, well, where do we go? Now we've, we've already done ministry in the east, in Phrygia and Galatia, so it doesn't really make much sense to go back there. We tried to do ministry in the south, uh, in Asia, and we were prevented. And then we tried to go north to Bithynia, and that, doesn't, that didn't work out. And so uh, it's really left us with one more place to go. We're just going to go west <laughs> by default to the seaport city of Troas. Um, they arrive in Troas, and then after an undisclosed amount of time, we finally get some solid direction. Right? Paul has a vision of a man from Macedonia calling on them for help. And the missionary crew determined that this was God's way of calling them to preach the gospel in Macedonia, which is northwest of them. Um, as a very side note, you'll notice in the text that Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, actually begins... Uh, writing in the first person. Uh, to this point in Acts, Luke always wrote in the third person. It was, they did this, they did that, they went here. Um, but in verse 11, Luke writes for the first time, we sought to go into Macedonia. Uh, this suggests that perhaps Troas is the location where Luke meets Paul for the first time and actually begins traveling with Paul uh, on his missionary journey. Uh, we know that Luke was a doctor, and so it would make sense as missionaries going into a foreign field to have a doctor accompany them, and uh, Luke seems to be that guy. Uh, and Luke himself experiences this direction from the Holy Spirit. Uh, but after detours and roadblocks and massive changes of plan, they finally have clear direction, and so they immediately go and, and set sail from Troas to uh, Macedonia. Interestingly, though, what we would think of as detours or roadblocks, what we would consider a very frustrating change of plans, Paul and company uh, credit this to the directing and guiding hand of God. Now, we don't know what they're feeling in that moment, but at least in hindsight, they were able to look back and see that it was the Spirit all this time that was directing 
their steps. It was the spirit that kept us from here, and it was the spirit that kept us from here, uh, but, but it was the supernatural vision that we took from God, from the spirit, that we are to go to Macedonia. God is directing our steps. What we see playing out so clearly in this story is what we would call God's providence. What is providence? Providence says that God is actively and personally at work in all things to govern, preserve, and direct so that ultimately his will may be accomplished and he may be glorified. God's providence is his active and personal work in all things to govern, preserve, and direct so that his will may be accomplished and his name may be glorified. We must understand that behind the veil of human understanding, there is a hidden hand of God at work that we cannot see. But even though we cannot see it with our own eyes, it is very real and it is very active. Really, God's providence is the continual work of God. It's not as if God kind of uh, created everything and then coiled it up uh, like some sort of wind-up toy only to let it go and, and then just sit back and watch it at play. No, he is actively involved in his creation in details big and small. God was not finished at creation. He kept going. Wayne Grudem, a theologian, uh, has written that if we understand that God is the all-powerful creator, it seems reasonable to conclude that he also preserves and governs everything in the universe as well. That's an overall picture of what's happening here in Acts 16. God is governing the events to his liking. What may seem as detours to us is really a part of God's roadmap. At no point is God somehow surprised or taken aback by something unexpected. It's, it's not as if God didn't know what was going on in Asia or Bithynia and said, oh, whoops, sorry, Paul, I led you the wrong way. Uh, here's a different course of direction. No, that didn't happen. J.I. Packer is written that what we have here is a picture of purposive personal management. Purposive personal management with total hands-on control. God is in control of this situation and he is guiding them every step of the way. Now the doctrine of God's providence, that, that is a, a, a huge doctrine that we could take months and years to study. There is so much on it, uh, but I want to highlight just three things from this passage that can help us in our understanding of God's providence. First, I want to make mention that Paul and his ministry partners had plans, and they were good plans, and they attempted to execute such plans. To the best of their human knowledge, to the best of their understanding of the Great Commission, they were doing what they were supposed to do. Despite God's providential control of all things, we as believers, not knowing all things, still have a responsibility to act. Of course, we can only take action within the boundaries of our own understanding and God will direct our steps as he sees fit, but this does not excuse us from the human responsibility to work and to act and to do all things unto the Lord. This is Proverbs 16.9. So it's the proverb that says that the, man, the heart of man plans his way or devises his way, but the Lord establishes his step. This proverb is what's happening here in Acts 16 in a nutshell. But Paul was a visionary. He was a strategist. He developed and designed plans in his heart and designed strategies for reaching the lost and for taking the gospel to the furthest corners of the world. Paul, in his heart, planned his way. 
And then he submitted his steps to the Lord. Sometimes we actually get that verse turned around. We we desire uh, for God to reveal the plan to us, to, to tell us, Lord, just tell me where I'm going. Tell me what you want me to do, and then leave me alone. And let me determine the steps. Let me establish the steps on how to get there. Show me the end, God, and then, I'll, and then I'll go there, okay? How many times have I sat in a room calling out to God, just, just asking, God, just which door do you want me to go through? Well, why don't you tell me what door to go through, and then I'll establish my steps accordingly. But that's not how human responsibility and God's providence work. No, we have the responsibility to make plans, right? To, to make good plans, God-honoring plans, and then we rest knowing that God will direct our steps. God's providence in the very steps we take does not absolve us from making plans, from moving forward, from exercising human responsibility. In light of God's providence, it may be tempting to just kind of sit back on the couch and say, you know, if he's going to direct my steps, I'm just going to, I'm just going to sit on the sideline. I'm just going to let it all play out in front of me. I'm not going to get involved. I'm not going to be active. It may be tempting for us to use this as a, a, an excuse towards laziness or disobedience. But this would be a terrible misunderstanding of the doctrine of providence. Because God uses our actions to provide real results. He uses our steps as the means to his end. Once again, Wayne Grudem has written that God's providential direction should not lead us to deny the reality of our choices and actions. Again and again, Scripture affirms that what Uh, that we really do cause events to happen. We are significant and we are responsible. We do have choices, and these are real choices that bring about real results. Just as God created things in nature with certain properties, God has made us in such a wonderful way that he has endowed us with the property of willing choice, a hearty belief in God's providence is not a discouragement, but actually a spur to action. God's providence should make us enthusiastic to get up and and work, knowing that God uses our actions. And this should actually bring us great comfort, because consider the alternative. Consider the alternative of blind, random fate. The idea of some sort of blind, impersonal force that's just magically pushing our world into the future. The feeling that everything is just kind of happenstance. That all we are is just merely a speck in the universe that's hurling through time and space at tens of thousands of miles by accident. And we just happen to be here And we just happen to be sitting here at this time and we just happen to be doing this or that activity because reasons and we just happen to be doing everything and there's no particular reason, it's just what it is. If we're subjected to that, if we're subjected to just pure fate, then go and do whatever your heart's desire is because there's no purpose in this life. If we are subjected to just pure fate, I am sorry to tell you that your life and everything you stand for is meaningless. Everything is done in vain. If God is not providentially moving us forward in time, then everything we do is for nothing. Because we're born, we live, we die, we're buried, and that's it. There's nothing more. What a terribly depressing life that would be. However, that is not the idea that Scripture teaches. No, Scripture teaches that there is purpose in our lives. That there is purpose 
in our steps because God uses our steps to accomplish his will and claim his glory. I can't think of a better reason to get up in the morning, drink my coffee, and go do my job. Knowing that God in the steps of my day is accomplishing his will. God in the steps of your normal day-to-day activities is accomplishing something. And God is bringing glory to his name. So, devise your plans, take action, and then submit your steps to God. The second item that I want to highlight in our passage is that um, with the exception of Paul's vision in Troas, we are not told how the Holy Spirit prevented them from entering Asia and Bithynia. And and because Luke describes this supernatural vision in Troas, it's very possible that the first two movements of the Holy Spirit were done by ordinary means, by normal means. That they were prevented from these areas, not because of some supernatural event, but because of normal day-to-day situations. You see, yes, God can guide our steps through supernatural means, but we too often forget that God is also the God of the ordinary. In fact, I would make the case that the supernatural events are the exception. That's why we call them supernatural or extraordinary because they happen outside of a normal experience. No, the supernatural events are the exception and God working through the ordinary steps of our life is the norm. Such visions like the one that Paul had, they're rare and they're unexpected by the characters they they involve. They're never actively seeking these. They just kind of happen, right? And so we can conclude that this vision that Paul has is an unusual form of divine guidance. No, instead God works through the normal occurrences of everyday life. But once again, we get that backwards, And we mix that up. In our life, we look for the the writing on the wall. We look for the random Bible verse to try and guide our steps. We long for that that huge breakthrough. We, we, We long and desire that dramatic dream. But more times than not, God orchestrates in the background. God, God is sitting here saying, just just take the steps, why don't you? Just, just put one foot in front of the other. Just keep walking and I will work through you and I will work in the ordinary parts of your life. Would you just trust me that I am powerful and wise enough to work extraordinarily through the ordinary? We sit waiting around for something more. And scripture itself says that we're already given everything we need to live a life that's honoring to God. And so there's no need to wait for anything else. God is saying, just go. Just take the steps. And trust me that I will direct them. God powerfully demonstrates his providence in the ordinary. And that in turn, as I've alluded to, makes his work as a whole extraordinary. Consider that. Consider all the small details of your day, of everyone's day, all the minutia of everyday life. These are the elements that make up the will of God. I can't even keep track of the small details of my day. Yet you have God in the background, not just orchestrating the small details in my life, but in your life and our life and the lives of the entire world throughout all history. How wonderful, how marvelous, how extraordinary. It's it's like how an elaborate or complicated machine is made up of very simple parts. While there's nothing significant about the parts in and of themselves, and while they serve a relatively simple purpose, what they create as a whole is magnificent. And this is... 
the, the same is true in God's dealing of the ordinary. Paul and company are kept from certain regions, seemingly by ordinary means, and they credit that once again in hindsight to the direction and the providence of the Holy Spirit. There's no need to wait around for the supernatural. Just be obedient and be faithful and trust that God is working in your midst. Number three, a third item to highlight in our passage about God's providence. Not only are we not told the how of God's direction, but in the moment we are also not told the why. When, when Paul and the missionary team are directed away from another region, we're not told why in that moment. It seems as though that they were kept from those regions so that they would end of, eventually wind up in Macedonia. But in the moment of the detour, when God throws the curveball, this is not revealed to them that they should go to Macedonia. They don't know why they were kept from those regions. They don't know what God is up to in the moment, in the here and now. And this is the challenge for us in God's providence. Because while God does indeed promise to direct your steps, he is under no obligation to tell you why he directs them in the ways that he does. He does not answer to you. And this is where the doctrine of providence hits so close to home. More than many doctrines, the doctrine of providence is not merely one that you know, but it's one that you feel, that you feel deeply. I wish I could tell you why God changed your plans. I wish I could tell you why your job is in shambles right now. I wish I could tell you why you were released from your job or why you're struggling to find a job. I wish I could tell you why your wedding day had to go a little bit differently this year. I wish I could tell you why your senior year or your child's senior year just didn't go according to plan. I wish I could tell you why your hopes and your dreams have been dashed. But I can't. If I could, I would. I would offer you such comfort. When something as significant as a pandemic comes in and just rocks our world, there's a great temptation to cry out to God, why? God, what are you doing behind the scenes? Why can't you tell me why you're directing our steps in this way? We, we just have this, such a strong desire to be in the know when in all reality, we may never know. We may even get to eternity, and God still may withhold things from us, information from us. Our struggle with the doctrine of providence is that our minds are so finite that we do not see, we cannot see the full incomplete picture. It's not revealed to us. And even if we could know, we are so small and our minds so finite that we couldn't even comprehend. It's not even that God is withholding something from us. It's that we can't even handle the grand scope of his master plan. You see, there is a massive, intricate, and elaborate picture being painted here by the master artist. And while we may see uh, different brush strokes here and there in our life, we may see the tiny, ordinary strokes of the Creator. We do not have even the capacity to fully understand the hand of the master artist and why certain strokes go the way they do. Yet, somehow, 
we think that God owes it to us to tell us such mysterious things. We feel like in our pride that we can know and we need to know what God is up to every step of the way. And here is where our response, a biblical response to God's providence comes in. When I approach God with such an attitude that I must know what he's up to, that I must know why he's directing my steps in, the, in such a way, that kind of attitude is the very antithesis to the Christian faith. It's the exact opposite of what faith in Christ and faith in God looks like. I'd like to read an excerpt from Kevin DeYoung's book entitled Just Do Something. Uh, DeYoung is a pastor out of North Carolina, and I couldn't sum up the application uh, better than himself. And so listen to what he has to say on the matter. DeYoung writes, Our fascination with the will of God often betrays our lack of trust in God's promises and provision. We don't just want his word that he will be with us, We want him to show us the end from the beginning and prove to us that he can be trusted. We want to know what tomorrow will bring instead of being content with simple obedience on the journey. And so we obsess about the future and we get anxious because anxiety, after all, is simply living out the future before it gets here. We must renounce our sinful desire to know the future and be in control. We are not gods. We walk by faith, not by sight. We risk because God does not risk. We walk into the future in God-glorifying confidence, not because the future is known to us, but because it is known to God. And that's all we need to know. Worry about the future is not simply a character tick. It is the sin of unbelief, an indication that our hearts are not resting in the promises of God. When we rest in the promises of God, whenever we come across what we perceive as a detour, we can say with confidence that this has come from God's fatherly hand. And if it has come from my father's fatherly, his fatherly hand, I know that it is for my good. And I know that it is for his glory. I may not understand it, but I know that God understands it. And that's enough for me. In Matthew 6, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's saying, hey, look, don't worry about your life. Just just don't worry. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink or wear tomorrow. And then he uses an illustration. He says, you see the birds? The birds are doing just fine, guys. God has fed them. He has kept them. Look at the fields and how the fields are adorned with beautiful flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow. If God, if God provides for the birds, and he clothes the fields with things that are temporary, with things that are not made in his image, what do you think he's going to do for you? If, if you are in Christ, if you are a believer in Jesus, you are a precious child of God. And if God cares so much for the birds and the flowers in the field, how do you think he's going to react to you? Of course he's going to provide for you. So you don't have to worry about it. If God has provision for those things that are here today and gone tomorrow that are so temporary, certainly he would care for you. So it's very clear that Jesus doesn't want us to worry about the future. God knows what we need before we even need it. And as long as God in his providence wants us to live, we're going to live and we're going to be fine. And there's going to come a day where it's going to be more glorifying to God that, that, that we die. And in God's providence, we're going to die. And that that day has been selected. And we'll die when God is ready for us to die. But what do we do until that day? Jesus gets through all of this. He says, don't worry, but here's what you need to do. In light of all of that, here is your mission. Here is what you are called to do. 
Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Jesus is saying, don't worry. Just seek God first and obey him and you'll be just all right. You'll be just fine. You want to know what God's will for your life is? Have you, if you're anything like me in the past, there may have been times where you've sat and you've looked up at the, the ceiling of your room in your bed saying, God, what is your will for my life? I'll tell you what God's will is for your life. God's will is for you to seek his kingdom first and obey him. Do that and God will direct your steps. This is what Paul and his team did. At the end of the passage, they experience the, the roadblock after roadblock, and then God directs them to preach the gospel in Macedonia, and they go immediately. They obey. When they came up against the roadblock, we don't get any kind of indication that they fought tooth and nail against God. No, they just they diverted to another area. They just obeyed. This is what they do, and this is what we're called to do. And this is most prominently what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the night before Jesus was crucified. Jesus is praying to God the Father in this garden, and it was such a moment of agony because Jesus knew what was coming next. He was in such agony that the, the, the gospel actually says that he was sweating droplets of blood. That is how, uh, how, how um, stressful this is for Jesus. And he, and he prays to his father in heaven. He says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. In other words, if there's any other way, God, if you, if you can fulfill your will any other way, if you can fulfill your purposes any other way, will you please relieve me from this duty? And then what Jesus says next are some of the most powerful words ever. He says, Father, if there's another way, relieve me from this. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then Jesus goes on and willingly surrenders and submits his life to death on a cross so that we could have life. This whole event in the Garden of Gethsemane is beautifully uh, depicted in a, in a modern day hymn um, from a group called City of Light. It describes this moment in verse 2, and I find myself singing that second verse on a daily basis uh, these days. This is what the verse reads like. It says, How in that garden he persisted, I may never fully know. The fearful weight of true obedience, it was held by him alone. What wondrous faith to bear that cross, to bear my sin, what wondrous love. My hope was sure when there my Savior prayed, Father, not my will, but yours be done. If you ever wonder how on earth God could use the utter mess in my life. How could anything good come out of the utter mess of life? Consider how God the Father in his providence allowed the most heinous and criminal act of all time to happen. He allowed his, in his will for his son, innocent of any wrongdoing, to be executed on the cross. It's the most wicked act in the history of the earth. Yet God allowed it so that Jesus Christ could secure the salvation of all men and women who place their trust in him and him alone. Would you pray with me? Father, we um, are struggling here, Lord. Very much this year, uh, we have tasted the uh, bitter brokenness of a fallen world. And it's painful, Lord. But, but we profess that you are not only in control, but you are actively, not passively, but actively orchestrating all things under your name so that your will would be accomplished and your name would be glorified. 
And for that, we praise you. While we may not understand, we trust that you do. And so would, you, would we cling to that truth? Lord, would you show your face to us, your precious, beautiful face, so that we can move forward in the confidence that is your providence. And in your holy name I pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand and close our time out with one more song.
For we know that in all things, all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And so go in this place in the confidence of God's wonderful and glorious providence. Amen. Go in peace. God bless you guys. Thank you.